A core component of analyzing algorithms is understanding their running time, and one of the most useful tools available for describing running time is big O notation, which gives us a convenient way of talking about growth rates. But when we look at the formal definition, there's no mention of algorithms or running time. Speaking formally, big O is a way to describe the growth rate of functions. So when we're analyzing an algorithm, step one is to come up with a function that describes the relationship between the size of an input to the algorithm and the algorithm's running time. And then step two is to perform big O analysis to understand the growth rate of that running time function. So let's dig into this formal definition of big O notation and think about what it means about the growth rate of functions. In our definition, we have two functions, t and f, and when we say that t of n is big O of f of n, informally what we're saying is that f gives us an upper bound on t. When we use this definition, the function t is the function we are trying to analyze and could be describing the running time of some algorithm, whereas f is a usually simpler function that we are comparing t against. So we're analyzing the function t, and we are comparing it to the function f. But the comparison that we're doing is based on these two positive constants, c and n sub 0. n0 is the point where our comparison begins. We say that for all inputs that are bigger than n0, the condition holds. So we are comparing the functions t and f from some starting point n0 and for all values of n bigger than n0. And the condition is that the output of t is less than or equal to c times the output of f. And so on my drawing, I have plotted the function t, and in red I have plotted not the function f, but rather c times f. So we can think of n0 as some starting point on this plot, and beyond n0 on our graph, c times f will always be above and so we can say that t is big O of f if there exists any constant multiple c that we can apply to f and any possible starting point n0 where beyond n0 c times f is always larger than t. So, for these two functions that I have plotted, if it continues to be the case that the red curve stays above the blue curve out to infinity, then this would demonstrate that for these particular functions f and t, t is big O of f. And so when we say that f gives us an asymptotic upper bound on t, it's allowed that there are some exceptions on small inputs that t might give us a larger output sometimes, but there is some starting point beyond which f is always larger. And it's not specifically the output of f that needs to be larger, but rather some constant multiple of the output of f, as long as there exists some starting point and some specific multiple, then we can say that t is big O of f. So if we want to prove that one function is big O of another, 
then we have to find appropriate values for the constants c and n0, and then we have to prove that this inequality holds for all n greater than or equal to n0. In the same sense that big O gives us an asymptotic upper bound, we can also define big omega for asymptotic lower bounds, and the definition is remarkably similar. All we need to change is that our notation goes from big O to big omega, and our inequality goes from the bounding function being larger to now the bounding function is smaller. And so with big omega, we're saying that beyond some starting point, it will always be the case that c times f is smaller than t, then we can say that t is big omega of f. It's also possible to have a function t that is both big O of f and big omega of f because we can choose different constants for the big O proof and the big omega proof. Specifically, it would be helpful to choose a large value of c for the big O proof so that when we multiply c times f, we get a function that grows faster. And then we could choose a small value of c for the big omega proof so that c times f grows slowly. And because we often want to choose a very small value of c in showing big omega lower bounds, the book uses a different variable name in its definition of big omega renaming c to epsilon to emphasize that when we're trying to find a lower bound, it helps to choose a small value for this constant multiple. But if we can find a function that is both an upper bound and a lower bound on t, possibly with different choices of constants, then we say that t is big theta of f. And so where big O gives us an upper bound on the growth rate, big omega gives us a lower bound on the growth rate, big theta gives us an asymptotically tight bound on the growth rate. An example of a big theta relationship would be n squared and 2n squared, where we could show that 2n squared is an upper bound if we choose c equals 1, and we could show that 2n squared is a lower bound if we chose, for example, c equals a quarter. So if you've encountered big O notation in previous computer science classes, you're probably familiar with the idea that when we're doing big O analysis of polynomials, we only care about the degree. We can ignore the constants and the low order terms. But how does this idea of just focusing on the degree of a polynomial come out of our formal definition? So let's try to prove this fact, that whenever f is a polynomial, we can say that f is big O of n to the k, where k is the polynomial's degree. And as we said, to prove a big O relationship, we need to choose c and n0 appropriately. So let's show how, for an arbitrary polynomial, we can construct a value of c and a value of n0, where c times n to the k will always upper bound the polynomial. We'll pick as our constant c the sum of the absolute values of all of our coefficients and we can just let n0 be 1. 
And so now we want to compare f against c times n to the k. So starting from our polynomial, we could make the output no smaller by taking the absolute value of all of the coefficients. And since we know that we are only thinking about values of n that are greater than or equal to n0, we know that n to the k is always going to be at least as large as n to any power smaller than k. And so we could replace all of our powers of n by n to the k, and that could again only make the output larger. But this, if we factor out n to the k, is just our constant times n to the k. And so we have that c times n to the k is at least as large as f for all inputs n that are at least 1. And so we've shown that f is big O of n to the k. And since we did this for an arbitrary polynomial in terms of its coefficients, we know that for any polynomial, it is big O of n to the degree of the polynomial. A question for you to think about is whether this relationship also holds for big omega. I encourage you to think through whether this proof also works for showing that f is big omega of n, or if not, how we would need to modify it, or if we need to set some further conditions on the polynomial in order to say that f is big omega of n to the k. Another note about this proof is that in this step, where we changed all of the terms to n to the k, it would have worked just as well with n to the k plus 1, or with any higher power than k. This still would have only made the polynomial larger. And so this tells us that any polynomial is big O of n to any power higher than the degree of that polynomial. And so in terms of polynomials, our lower degree polynomials are always upper bounded by higher degree polynomials. So big O notation gives us a great way to classify the growth rates of different polynomials. But what if we want to compare polynomials to other types of functions? Common ones that come up in running time analysis would include logs or exponentials. So here I am claiming that if we have a logarithmic function and a polynomial function, that the log is big O of the polynomial, and that this holds for any base I might choose for the log and any degree I might choose for the polynomial. Likewise, I claim that when comparing polynomials to exponentials, that a polynomial of any degree is big O of any exponential, no matter the base. So intuitively, any polynomial function grows faster than any logarithmic function, and any exponential function grows faster than any polynomial function. And this holds even if the polynomial is of degree 1,000, and the exponential has a base of 1.00001, it will still be the case that this big O relationship holds 
if we go out far enough on the number line, we'll get to a point where those functions cross and the exponential is growing faster than the polynomial. And likewise, even if we choose the fastest growing logarithmic function and the slowest growing polynomial, if we go out far enough, the polynomial will eventually grow faster. So, how would we prove these claims? Well, the easiest way I know of is to use a lemma that gives us an alternate way of thinking about big O notation. So, here we're thinking about taking the output of function f and dividing it by the output of function g, and taking the limit as n goes off to infinity. So intuitively, we would expect that if f, the function on the top of the fraction, is growing faster, then this limit would go off to infinity. Or if g, the function on the bottom, is growing faster, then this limit would go to zero. And in fact, if this limit exists, then it is possible to prove that the limit tells us about the big O relationship between f and g. So if the limit of this fraction as n goes to infinity is non-zero, that means either the limit goes off to infinity or it goes to some non-zero constant, then we know that g is big O of f because we are not in the case where the denominator is growing faster that pushes the limit to zero. Likewise, if the limit is not infinity, that means the limit is any constant, then we know that we are not in the case where the numerator is growing much faster, and so we know that f is big O of g. Another way to think about this is that if the limit goes to zero, then that means g is growing faster, and so g gives us an upper bound on f. If the limit goes to infinity, then f is growing faster, so f gives us an upper bound on g. And if the limit goes to some non-zero constant, then we have a constant ratio between f and g. And so, because the ratio between them is constant, we could pick a value of c in the big O definition to make either of them upper bound the other. And so that means that they're actually the same big theta. So then, if we have a proof of this lemma, we could use it to compare a polynomial and an exponential, or a polynomial and a log. And then when we look at the limit of this fraction, we could potentially apply the Hopital's rule to take derivatives and simplify, and eventually show that this fraction goes to zero or infinity, depending on which function we assign as f or g. We're not going to go through all of the details, but you should feel free to use these claims in your analyses of running time later. We could also think about how we would go about proving this lemma. And the key idea here is that we can extract the constant c that we need for the big O definition from the definition of the limit. Again, I'm not going to go through this proof in detail, but you should feel free to use this lemma in thinking about big O analysis of functions. So now that we have some understanding of the formal definitions behind big O notation, how does this help us in analyzing algorithms? Well, for one thing, it lets us simplify the functions that we use to talk about running time. If we describe the running time of some algorithm and get some messy polynomial, then we know if we care about the big O analysis of the running time that we can simplify that to just the degree of the polynomial. Additionally, 
if we know that we're going to be doing big O analysis, where the eventual comparison we will make is whether an algorithm is big O of n squared or big O of n log n, if we're careful about how we construct the function that describes the running time, then we can sweep a lot of the constants under the rug along the way and not have to come up with such a complicated function describing the running time, making our job of running time analysis much simpler. We'll see examples of applying this to algorithms we already know in the next class. And finally, big O comparisons between different classes of functions let us talk about which algorithms are efficient and which are not. And so it's worth taking a moment to define what we mean by an efficient algorithm. When we talk about an algorithm being efficient, there are a couple of different ways we might mean that. Sometimes it's problem specific, where we are trying to come up with the most efficient possible algorithm for a particular problem. And if we know things about the problem that we're solving, we might have a sense of what constitutes efficient and what doesn't. For example, if I asked you to come up with a sorting algorithm and you came back with an algorithm and an analysis that showed you could solve the problem in n cubed time, that would not be very efficient because we know we can come up with ways of doing sorting in n squared or n log n time. On the other hand, if we are asking can a problem be efficiently solved? Does there exist an efficient algorithm for a problem? Then what we usually mean is, is there some algorithm that can solve the problem in polynomial time? The reason for this is that any polynomial is better than any exponential, and so if we have an algorithm that runs in exponential time, that's definitely inefficient compared to any possible polynomial time algorithm. And so as we study various problems throughout the semester, we will be looking for polynomial time algorithms and trying to find the most efficient algorithms we can. And towards the end of the semester, we will come to the question of classifying problems based on which ones we can solve in polynomial time and which ones do we think we cannot come up with a polynomial time algorithm to solve.